What's going on, people? We are Tottenham TV back here for another match review of Spurs. I beat Nottingham Forest by three goals to one at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium yesterday, which put Spurs into the top four after Villa's draw with Brentford and also equaled our, our points tally from the whole of last season, which is quite incredible with seven games to go, 60 points, albeit it was a particularly low tally last season, but uh, finishing eighth in the table. But I guess it's positive signs, isn't it? Signs of progress. And I think, to be fair, last season, we probably hit this points tally around the same time and then we went on to lose, <laughs> like, we went on to lose like, seven of our last eight games or something, getting battered, yeah. you know, 6-1 by Newcastle, getting battered, uh, well, we lost 4-3 to Liverpool, lost to Brentford, so... It goes to show as well, because, like, the whole way through the season, we were like, oh, we're on the same points tally as last season, we're on the same points tally yeah. as last season, and now we're on the points tally that we ended on last season. But I'm hoping, I'm bloody hoping, we have a different end to the season this season, the last season. It was another solid win, another good home win. I don't think the performance level was um, that different to what we've seen in, in recent weeks. I think it was probably a deserved win um, in the end of the day. But it was another classic uh, Spurs in the first half. Could have been 2-1 down, but turned it around with a burst in the second half. And that yeah. seems to be a theme at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I thought Spurs did start the game well first 20 minutes I thought we were heavily dominant without creating too much I mean Timo Werner was a problem on that left hand side um, quite a few times he was getting the better of Nico Williams I think it was and um, the first goal was uh, was um, evidence of that wasn't it you know he gets down the left hand side with the ball played in from Hyung Min Son and Murillo had no other option but to put it in the back of his net he tried his best but um, own goal seeming one of our best friends at the moment and um, I thought Timo Werner was probably our most dangerous player there in those first 20 minutes when we were heavily on top yeah, and it was classic Ange ball. It was actually, if you, the, the build-up play, the approach play was really, really positive. Um, Basuma, who got obviously hooked off at half-time, uh, he was heavily involved in that first goal with some really good knitting of the play together between him, Madison, Son. Plays in Werner on the left-hand side. Classic Werner shifts on to his right, goes to a down to his left, and bam, across the face of goal. Brilliant ball. And he's, those uh, passes with his left foot across the face of goal that he's performing in recent weeks is really paying dividends. And obviously, he got the one with the own goal. Nearly a few minutes later, got one as well, which would have been a carbon copy of the goal we scored at West Ham, which uh, Brennan Johnson makes that run of the near post. And this time, the keeper gets in the way. Ne nearly happened as well. Luton, because Timo mm. Werner, well, it was a Timo Werner, but anyway, it was across the face of goal. And this time, Johnson uh, nearly got over the line but it was just um, millimetres uh, not over the line so that's definitely been something we've been working on in training and definitely is something clearly that the team um, is able to carry on a consistent basis now and Timo Werner you, look you've got to give him credit because he's getting those positions consistently and the quality is improving it seems game by game and he had another one in the second half as well which flashed right across the face of goal which if Brendan Johnson would have gambled he could have scored you saw um, after that chance was missed Brendan Johnson had his head in his hands like that because he knew he should have gambled he just didn't for some reason on that occasion so Timo Werner fair play um, really starting to add consistency to that delivery and that's all you're asking for really yeah and if you bring up the phone for a second if you look at the progress bar you can see how heavily dominant in terms of uh, possession we were in the opening 20 25 minutes and Nottingham Forest did get a goal out of completely well before they scored that goal they, before even we scored that goal they tried uh, something from inside their own half I think it was Murillo nearly catching Vicario off guard I think did he take some inspiration <laughs> from Bruno Fernandes earlier on that day yeah I wonder if he'd be watching <laughs> <laughs> the Manchester game and he saw that because that would I mean I know Robinson scored from like near his own his own box but in terms of an open play that might, that would have been surely the furthest ever I've yeah, never I seen a shot so. from that deep um, and Vicario was caught absolutely cold I can't believe Mar uh, Murillo tried that but uh, we were talking to Wolfie about Murillo before the game. He's a very, very confident centre-back. I didn't realise he's only 21. Um, seems like a really good prospect. And obviously that shows his quality. And you've got to have some power in your boots to get a shot over Vicaro from there. And if it wasn't for a bit of luck, and thankfully it just, just dragged wide, but what an effort. Because it looked like when it bounced just before it hit, like um, just before it went slightly wide, it looked like it maybe was swerving in, but uh, luckily for us it wasn't, and it saved our blushes, and particularly Vicar Vicario's blushes. But when Nottingham Forest did score, first of all, it was terrible defending. A doggy just completely caught in no man's land. Van der Ven comes over to try cover him, and there's just spaces and gaps all over that defence, and um, Chris Wood does what Chris Wood does, especially this season, and put, that's put the ball in the back of the net. I mean, it was completely against the run of play, wasn't it? Yeah, it was... 
out of nowhere, really, Forrest weren't really threatening. Um, Van der Ven seemed to be mopping up um, everything that went over the top. There was even a moment where I think Hudson Odoi looked like he was about to get in on goal. Van der Ven yeah. comes over like a steam train, wins it back, and he gets like a standing ovation for that recovery. And Van der Ven looked like he was patrolling things. But that did happen. Look, the goal happened. We were completely cut open on the counter attack. Elanga down the right hand side, finding all sorts of space. As you say, a doggy um, caught. Um, caught asleep I think and then Van der Ven is forced to come over because the dog is out of position and no, neither Saar or Basuma um, were covering in the centre and that was really disappointing there was all that space in the centre and yet again it seemed like attackers seem to have to weigh too much time in those situations for us what I would say is uh, Romero was a bit unlucky because when Elanga gets the cross off um, to Wood it does take a bit of a deflection off Romero and just perfectly falls into uh, Chris Wood's path and then Wood's finish goes through the legs of Pedro Porro so it was a bit of luck but I don't think we have we can complain too much about the goal because we were just carved right open and it's a theme where we don't give up too many chances but when we do it seems to be very good quality chances and that yeah. was another that was more evidence of that yeah, absolutely. And then for some reason after that, the whole dynamic of the game changed, particularly uh, obviously the first half. And it looked like heads were dropped, confidence sapped out of them. And Nottingham Forest just really started to put on us. I thought a doggy was having a torrid time uh, down that left hand side. I thought Nico Williams and Elanga uh, were really getting the better of him at times during that second half. And they nearly scored again, albeit a great save from Vicario. And then Chris Wood has uh, the goal to aim at and smashes it. Um, on the right-hand side of the post where, you know, it was a complete open goal from about three yards out. I don't know what he's thinking. And I don't know how the hell he didn't score that. And if Forrest go 2-1 up at that stage, you know, you're probably fearing the worst. But luckily, luckily he didn't score because Forrest were well on top at that point. Yeah, it was a top save from Vicario because I think he saw it late. You could see with the strike from Yates uh, low down to his left, I think goes for a couple of bodies and Vicario has to use his um, best reflexes just to get a hand on that. And it was an excellent save, um, really a brilliant save at a crucial time. But how Chris Wood misses that, I don't know what he's thinking. He just, instead of just literally putting in the MTA, he decides I'm going to just smash this into the net for God knows what reason. And luckily for us, it just smacks off the post and we get a bit of luck. Obviously, falls to Gibbs White after that and his strike is uh, wide. But we've just got massive, massive let off. And actually, in that moment as well, Porro got, got caught out because it, mm. it was a lovely ball over the top to uh, Ole Aina, and he takes it on the chest brilliantly. Uh, Pedro Porro goes to the header, completely misjudges it, and they were in behind. And at that moment, uh, Forrest would look like they were building some momentum, but that missed chance was a big turning point uh, in the game because if they get that, as you say, that puts them perfectly in the situation they want to be, in the lead, able to play on the counter-attack as well, and it gives them something to really hang on to. And in the situation they're in, battling for relegation, when you take the lead at somewhere like Spurs and that in, at that point in the game, that would have been very, very difficult because you just imagine they're just going to put nine men or ten men behind the ball and it's going to be very hard to break down. Luckily for them, they missed it. We had a fairly strong end to the half. I remember Brendan Johnson had a cross deflected onto the crossbar. But I guess the moment uh, that Nuno was complaining about after the game was the Madison moment just before the break where uh, he has a little swipe at uh, Yates. Uh, he goes down uh, like a ton of bricks. He's calling for VAR. And uh, Madison, I think, who was actually already on the yellow, someone said. Um, I'm not sure if that's true, but apparently he was no, already... He didn't. he didn't get booked. No, he was in already on the yellow when that no, happened? he didn't get booked in the game, no. Didn't get booked at all? Okay. So he was... Look, let's be honest, he was very fortunate in that moment not to uh, get reprised with VAR. I think he just got away with it because there wasn't, like, an active, like, pullback of the arm. Yeah, and... I guess that's the only thing you can say. You, uh, the, apparently, the AR judged it wasn't violent conduct um, from James Madison. But maybe that was evidence of him losing his cool and being frustrated because, again, he just wasn't having the best game uh, on on the day. Uh, he admitted that after the game that he's not in his best form. He feels like he's getting close to it, but he's not in his best form right now. And Ryan Yates was... Um, pretty much hovering over him wasn't he the whole game I think he made a number of fouls on him I think he made like three or four fouls during the game a few of them on Madison and Madison may be getting a bit frustrated that wherever he looked Yates was there and maybe at that moment he just lost his call cool. Yeah, no, he did. And he shouldn't be doing that. He gives the referee a and VAR a decision to make at that point. And yeah, luckily for us, he didn't get sent off. But, you know, on another day, if the referee pulls out the card there, VAR ain't overturning that. So 
as much as I don't think maybe it was a red card, it does give the referee a decision make. So I think it's silly play uh, from Madison. But then again, Forrest should have been down to 10 men with an absolutely horrendous challenge. I think it was on Madison, wasn't it? With, um, it was on Lo Celso. With, sorry, yeah. with Lo Celso later on in the game with a high foot into the knee. I mean, how the hell? First of all, how the hell is the ref not spotting that? And how the hell is VAR not picking that up? Yeah horrendous challenge he only he did get a booking straight away i don't know why var doesn't go back and say that's a terrible challenge because we've seen what um we've seen challenges work that aren't as bad as that var go back to and say actually this is violent conduct in it and should be red card you look at romero's one against chelsea uh, i don't think that was as bad as what da uh, danilo did yesterday and that was pulled up and um, given a red card so i think they got very lucky in that situation to not be down to 10 men yeah but nuno was complaining about the madison moment i do think if those moments go in forest favor the the moment that hit the post and obviously the madison red card that would have been a very very difficult game for us um and we did lose control a bit in those moments like we did get a bit lucky in those moments that it went in our favour. Madison doesn't get the red card. But I would say Ryan Yates, he's such a prick, isn't he? I absolutely he's hate. Dirty, oh, dirty he's player. so dirty. And as well, let's be honest, as much as it was a, a bit of a... Um, a well, I don't even know if you can call it as violent as a punch, but a bit of a hit by Madison at the moment. Yates was not hurt by that, let's be honest. And he goes down as if he's been shot in the stomach. And uh, it was obviously a ploy to get Madison sent off. And the fact Madison did that, as you say, of course, he literally lost his call. I'm sure he'll admit that after the game that it wasn't something he was proud of. And he, it was just a little brain, brainless moment from him, a head loss moment, I should say, for Madison. But Yates tried to take full advantage of it, didn't he? And he's such a dirty player. He makes so many fouls, and he's one of those players who just winds up the opposition, a bit of a shit house. and he nearly got the better of Madison, but luckily for us, the referee didn't call him up on it. Yeah, he's basically another Neil Morpai, isn't he? Uh, one of these kind of players. And look, you expect players to make a meal out of these things to try and gain an advantage in the game. You've seen it time and time again, year after year in the Premier League. League. You even saw it in the Arsenal Brighton game on the weekend. I don't know if you saw it. Um, I can't remember which Brighton player it was, but he had a bit of a coming together with uh, Ben White. Mm. And Ben Esther White, Pinyan it was. yeah, Esther Pinyan. And Ben White just goes down holding his neck <laughs> like he's been slashed in the throat or something. It was unbelievable. I yeah. couldn't believe what I was seeing with Ben White. That, now that was embarrassing. Yeah, and I don't know if you saw Roy Keane's comments after the game with Ryan, about Ryan Yates. He said, you know, he's a player who likes to give it, but as soon as Madison gives it back a bit, he's you know on the on the floor like a sack of. <laughs> bricks and he can't he, he doesn't want to take it so I think that there's a something to say about that but we went into halftime obviously at 1-1 again a disappointing uh first half from Spurs again a first half where we could have we could have been behind but again a first half where we don't go into the um halftime leading uh, again in another game just off the back of Tuesday where we had a bright start it was one that we were leading at halftime no it was 1-1 one, one. oh it was 1-1 one, one. Yeah, yeah sorry Chris Wood it was and um it was very similar to the game. We on, scored in the first half yeah, this time. It was very similar to the game on Tuesday in terms of how the first, second, first half went. Very bright start, got the opening goal. We were in the in control in the ascendancy. And then out of nowhere, we conceded an equaliser and we go into the second half at 1-1. But the difference between this uh, this time is he made a double change at half time. Yeah, and I thought rightly so because I think Basuma, as much as he... I, I thought actually Basuma started the game well um, in the first 20 minutes. I, re, I was really enjoying Basuma's performance defensively, Sound, uh, contributing to the attack, he even had a few shots from 20, 25 yards, which I think was a clear instruction from Ange before the game, because it seems as though we were looking for the shot a lot more in this game than we had previously. And obviously Ange did mention it in his pre-match press conference saying, yes, my players are allowed to shoot. And they showed <laughs> they're, they're allowed to shoot um, in this game. And obviously that's where the Van der Ven goal came from. But Pat Mate Sara, I don't think was at the races for pretty much uh, the whole of the uh, first half, to be honest. And um, Saar was rightly taken off. And Bissouma, after they scored, I just think he just completely let his standard slip as well. So I think both of them were warranted to be taken off. And the two players that did come on in Hoybier and Bentank will completely change the course of the game. Yeah, and it's no surprised that I think we were restricting Forrest a lot more in that second half after Hoybier and Bentacor came on. I think it was more to do with what they were doing off the ball than on the ball as, as much because I thought on the ball Basuma and Saar I mean, weren't terrible. I thought Basuma, obviously heavily involved in the first goal, was doing pretty some good stuff. But off the ball, as we saw with those chances created by Forrest, a lot of them coming from uh, Basuma just not doing his job defensively. Not Sometimes it annoys me with Basuma where he, he notices da danger, but he doesn't like bust a gut to get in the box and, and, and fix it. He kind of just ambles back in and 
uh, allows uh, the opposition to kind of get a chance. And obviously Ryan Yates for that chance, which uh, forced to save out Vicario. He had all the time in the world to line up that shot yeah. and like no pressure on him. And that was really frustrating. But once B Basuma and ben, um, once Bentancourt and Hoybier came on, I felt like they just added that bit more bite, a bit more intensity and said after the game that he felt like it wasn't so much that Saar and Basuma were doing terrible. It's just more he wanted more legs on the pitch. He wanted a bit more <laughs> intensity. And that's definitely what Ben Tancor and Hoybier uh, provided. And as well, I felt like they provided a bit more purpose with their passing uh, in terms of Hoybier was playing some really good long range passing, getting the ball forward quickly with some accuracy. They made a really good impact um, in that in that first half, in that um, first opening exchanges. And obviously we started the, the half really well. Brendan Johnson had a chance at the back post again from Averna um, cross, which uh, he kind of goes with his boot where maybe he should have gone with his head. And that, that was a chance missed. And then obviously we get the goal, which uh, everyone was saying, shoot, shoot, shoot to everyone. I think Johnson had a chance to shoot. He didn't take it. Son had a chance to shoot. He didn't take it. I think Van der Ven said after the game, you know, I, I felt once I got that ball, I'm just going to lever it because someone had to bloody shoot. So, and what a shot it was. Didn't think he had that kind of effort in him. It's quite funny. Madison said uh, in his interview after the game that if you, if you watch training, uh, it's fair to say Van der Ven's shooting is not one of his strong points. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's something that uh, he's been criticised for in training, but you wouldn't have known it because what an effort. Absolute yeah. hammer, hammer, hammer blow, wasn't it? What a, what a shot right into the top corner as well. Great technique and... Um, he was our best player even without the goal, and that just cemented it. That, that yeah, strike. unbelievable. I mean, I'm surprised that uh, the ball didn't break the net. That's mm. how strong it was. Uh, it was unbelievable to see. And after all the times that he saved us in the first half um, with the counter-attacks that Villa were trying to pose, um, it was only right for him to score a goal like that. And yeah, you're right. I mean, it was frustrating at times just saying, shoot, 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 shoot. And then Van de Ven is the one that just takes it, uh, you know, one touch on his left foot and then bang, uh, rifling it into the top corner. Unbelievable goal. Um, and it just kind of set us on our way and the stadium kind of came to life after that. And um, there was only one team that were really going to win it after Van de Ven um, hit that shot and again Spurs scoring in clusters because another goal from a defender from Pedro Porro great ball into the box from James Madison lovely guided header from uh, Rodrigo Bentancourt to find Pedro Porro and then first time bang into the far corner and um, another defender scores for Tottenham and now that's what is it four goals for Romero two goals for Van de Ven two goals for a doggy and two goal and one or two goals for Porro uh, two in the all, all comps, mm. one in one in the Premier League. A brilliant finish. We know that Porro has that technique, don't we, on on his right foot. When it fell to him, even though he hasn't scored in the Premier League this season, you just felt like he's going to hit the target here because he's got a brilliant strike. He's actually, if you look at all his goals he scored for Spurs, I think all every single one, I don't think he's ever scored like a tap-in, uh, Pedro Bro. He's always an absolute banger. He's got an unbelievable strike on him. It was a brilliant finish there. But actually, in terms of the goal, I want to talk about Ben Tankle because I... When I watched it first, I wasn't sure if he was like going for goal and he just um, miss hit the header. But if you look on the replay, there was a, there was a slow mo replay they showed on match of the day when the ball comes in from Madison. You can very clearly see that Ben Tenkor, when he flicks the header, he immediately looks to the right. I think I think he knew that there was two players there at the back post, completely free. There was Poro, and I think Udogi, I think as well, was also free there. But it falls to in right into Poro's path. Brilliant strike right into the roof of the net. Um, excellent um, technique from from Pedro Poro, and he should be doing more of that. Um, getting in the box and scoring those goals because he's got that in him uh, he's got a brilliant finish on him he's one of the best striker of the balls uh, from fullback I think in the Premier League we all know that and that goal was a long time coming he should be a player who aims to get you know five goals a season yeah, I think he's that good uh, with, with his technique obviously he's on seven assists as well so we know he's got ability to be effective in the final third obviously with that brilliant goal against Burnley um, in January as well in the FA Cup so we know he's got a brilliant strike on him he should be getting more goals and that was evidence of it and um, yeah again Tottenham capitalising on momentum and, and um, playing in waves and they couldn't handle us when we were playing very quickly and we made it 3-1 and uh, I th you felt like 3-1 the game wasn't really uh, in doubt. Have we given up a two-goal lead yet this season? I don't, I don't think, think so. so no. I don't think we've given up a lead once we've got two goals ahead. So I think we're very good in those situations. What I would say is, once we went to 3-1, uh, we had a couple of openings. Werner flashes a ball across the face of goal, which uh, no one taps home. Uh, someone should have. I think Son, obviously, very late on in the game, had a shot that hit the post. But we didn't really go for the throat, I felt. 
I felt three one. It's almost as though, as if at times we felt like the game was won and we were just playing it around. Maybe look, you could argue at those points you want to calm it down a bit. You don't want to allow too much chaos because you don't want to allow Forest back into the game. And I think we did a good job just kind of um, restricting Forest at that moment. Apart from the moment where Hoybier just plays a I suicidal ball. We did ball a good job of... predicting three one and predict the prem. Yeah, I definitely. Yeah, maybe they knew uh, <laughs> that, that I had three one, so they calmed it down a bit. But. I did feel like as well I was a bit frustrated because I felt a few times uh, in the last like 25 minutes or so we had some really good opportunities to play some really quick football, get up the pitch quickly and go on a counter and we just decided to slow it down, play it backwards and instead of going forward and allow Forrest like time to settle and stuff and at those moments you're free one up, you know Forrest have to come out and you know they're, they're desperate for points so they can't uh, just allow that game to see out to, to a loss, they need to go for goals. And I felt like we didn't take advantage of that situation as much as I would have hoped. Maybe that will come in time uh, once we have better control of games. Maybe we just... Because I think we have been guilty as well this season, is to be fair, where we have a good position, we're in the lead, and we allow the opposition back into the game for our own sloppiness and chaos and just trying to play 100 miles an hour all the time. So I think that that's a fair criticism. Maybe we did a better job of controlling the game yesterday. But... I just felt like for those last 20 minutes, we could have done a bit of better job of exploiting Forrest coming at us rather than just kind of taking what we have and, and, and sitting on it. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I, I want to um, talk about Ben Tancor and, and also pierre Emma Hoybier, who did come on at half time because I mentioned before how I thought they, they really changed the course of the game and they gave us that calm and drive in the middle of the park. Um, I call it like maybe chaotic calmness uh, <laughs> from, um, from Ben Tancor and Hoybier because they're not, you don't associate with maybe Ben Tancor, but definitely not Hoybier with being like car, a calm player. And I thought that they added so much to that midfield, albeit Hoybier nearly did put his uh, good work down. Uh, to waste right at the end when he did play that bad pass out the back and Nottingham Forest did nearly score. But I thought both of them put in such great performances and definitely Hoybier, who hasn't really had a look in in terms of starting lineups. I think he's put himself in the conversation now to be starting. What I would say is I was actually, I was, I agree with you. I thought they had a brilliant impact and I thought the intensity they brought to the midfield, I think it's just more the bite they, they brought to that midfield, um, making sure that the Yates, Gibbs White, Gibbs White and Danilo just weren't having the influence they were in the first half and all of a sudden they were getting heavily restricted because of the energy they brought and it was brilliant. I thought going forward, obviously, Bentecon and Hoybier um, added that bit more technical ability uh, in, in the final third, a bit more accurate passing, forward passing as well, quicker passing. That comes when, you know, fresh legs at half time, you can add that intensity. I thought Bentecon had a fantastic overall half I thought he was brilliant obviously got involved in the third goal as well and I thought going forward he was fantastic they, they found it so hard to get the ball of him Hoybier had a brilliant impact but I actually felt in the last 15 minutes he was putting us in not it wasn't just that situation where he plays a blind pass across the face of goal and gives the ball straight to Forrest and they nearly get a goal from it I thought he was really sloppy in those last like 10 minutes gave the ball away a few times in really bad positions and I was starting to get really frustrated with him so I thought a lot of the I wouldn't say all his good work was undone because obviously we were 3-1 up at that point but I thought um, the impact he made diminished in the, in the latter stage of the game and I was getting very frustrated with how sloppy he was being and a bit careless I think is the best word for it just being very very careless on the ball so that is something that we know Hoybier is capable of what, I feel like well, Koibia, he has to be like 100% concentration to, to be at his best. As soon as he lets that slip a bit, he just starts being a bit careless, playing blind balls nowhere, and he lets his touch get away get, get away from him and his pass to start getting sloppy. And I thought that was happening in the last 10 minutes, to be honest. But a lot a lot of the good work he did made, made sure we were 3-1 up, so I can't uh, take that credit away from him. But I was frustrated with his last, uh, last 10 minutes of the game. Yeah, obviously, if we let in a goal at that moment through his bad work, I think it's going to be highlighted a lot more. But like me, I, I prefer to just focus on, on the good play that he did do in the game because I think for the majority of the time that he was on the pitch, I thought he was one of the best players on the park. Uh, that's how good I thought he was. Um, really combative in the middle, his long balls out... Um, out wide, I thought with pinpoint, he was taking shots as well. I think he had what? three or four shots mm. um, in that second half. So again, that clear instruction to shoot on sight from Spurs. Yeah, I think Basuma had four in the first half. Hoybia had four in the second half. Uh, Son had one. Van der Ven had one that he obviously scored from. So it's great to see that finally Spurs are taking some shots instead of just continuing with that shoehorn football. 
yeah, and it obviously paid off because Van der Ven scored from 25 yards. So it's a tactic that we know against a low block, you sometimes you just got to try your luck and see what happens. Some, sometimes in golf in on deflection, and you see the best teams, uh, especially I think Liverpool out of the t teams at the top of the best are doing it in terms of just peppering the opposition with um, loads and loads of shots. And more often than not, it, that will um, help break the deadlock. And usually they'll get a bit of luck. You, and you make your own luck in, in this sport. And obviously there was nothing lucky about Van der Ven's goal. It was a brilliant goal. But I think the clear instruction that if there's not too many opportunities to break down the opposition just try your luck from distance definitely paid off I think Hoybier forced a brilliant save ourselves as well just after the, the break as well so I think we had some really good efforts from distance in this game and that definitely helped us uh, get the three points yeah um, in terms of James Madison let's um Let's look at him in terms of his stats in the game. You can see from the heat map, uh, that's where you want James Madison, and that's where you see him uh, for the most part. I did think that he was poor in the first half, but did um, kind of grow with the team in the second half. Four key passes on the day, two shots blocked, um, four out of his six ground jewels won, and fouled three times. I think every single one of those fouls were probably from Yates. But... <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I don't think Madison put in a bad performance by any stretch of the imagination, but I do think that it's nowhere close to the levels that we know that James Madison can provide. Yeah, and I think Madison admitted that after the game. He said he feels like he's not on the form that he said won him Player of the Month earlier in the season, and he's uh, for one reason or another he's just not at that level at the moment. And he and he said he admitted that he says he's very self-critical, and he admits he's not at that level for one reason or another. But he says also he doesn't feel like he's too far away, yeah. and he feels like he's getting there. I see Madison, again, I still see him doing some brilliant stuff. The way, again, he moves his body, he swivels on the ball. It's so hard for um, midfielders to to kind of track that. And that's why he gets fouled so many times. And as you say, four key passes, I think that's more than anyone else on the pitch. So clearly, he's still creating opportunities and he's still doing stuff on the pitch, which is great. And obviously, he was heavily involved in the third goal as well. Brilliant work great down ball. the left-hand side. Good ball to Ben Tancor and... Um, uh, and I, he was involved in the first goal as well with some good link up between him, Son and Basuma to get Werner in down the left-hand side. So there's still some really good stuff there from Madison, but you just know he's got so much more to give. You know he's got so much more quality in his boots where he's got magic in his boots. What, I'm, what I guess what I'm saying is at the moment, I'm seeing some like good stuff. I'm not seeing the magic that we know he's capable of. Yeah. And this is a player that you know from those deep positions can play the ball in a sixpence over the top. He can fire a shot in from 25 yards into the top corner. Uh, he can have some magical moments. I think he's missing that sprinkle of magic at the moment for one reason or another. And again, it was another game, I guess, taken off on the 70th minute for Giovanni Lo Celso, who had a pretty good, pretty good cameo, I thought, again, uh, for the final 20 minutes. Um, again, uh, uh, another game he hasn't got a goal or assist, so we'll play into the narrative that he's not having the best time. But again, I, I agree. I don't think it was his best performance by any stretch of the imagination. I don't think he was, it was a stinker or he was poor. And we know he's got more to give, but for one reason or another, he's just not hitting those heights he was earlier in the season, which when we know he's got that in him, it's going to be frustrating when he's not there at the moment. But that's the thing, right? You're always going to be kind of judged again your, against your past performances. And when people know what he can produce, like in those first 10 games of the season, when he was literally the best uh, or one of the best uh, attacking midfielders in the Premier League, you're always going to be judged on that. And when you put in performances like you are doing recently, you're going to get criticised for it. And that's the nature of fandom, I guess. But I, for, I for one, I see this more as a snapshot in time rather than something that uh, is going to be an ongoing situation, although you could argue it has been going on for a couple of months. So that is something to, to say and to be concerned about. But I still see uh, the value in having Madison in the team, even when he's yeah. in this kind of form. So... He's going to be judged because he had such a good start. That's that's the level he's going to be held to. And I'm sure he hold, hold, holds himself to that level as well. But at the moment, it's not working out like that. Yeah. And um, Kulisevsky did come on, didn't he, for the last fi final 15 minutes. And I thought, again, another really poor display uh, from Deki. I mean, there were so many times he gets the ball and there's he's he's got runners off him. He's got the opportunity to play the ball, just dallies on the ball, waits too long. And ultimately, the moves break down. And I thought it was a really frustrating cameo from Kulisevsky. Yeah, I think the 
there, there's a difference. I think Kulisewski actually had a stinker when he came yeah. on, and I thought he had a stinker when he came on against uh, West, West Ham. Ham as well. So he's in a very low moment at the moment, I have to say, Decky. I feel for him because I know he's trying. I don't see a player who's not trying. I see him uh, trying to pull things off. You know he's he's a high-quality player. He's capable of p um, pulling things off that he's not at the moment. But I have to say, every time he got the ball, he was giving it away. He had really promising openings. That was like one moment, I think it was Le Celso playing him for on goal and he just slow instead of like going for the penalty box and charging at his defender he slows himself down kind of looks for the pass and as soon as uh he takes those extra few seconds the passing lane is blocked and and his pass gets blocked uh he actually started off on the left hand side which was uh, something that uh, a lot of people been calling for him to play didn't look totally comfortable there to be honest uh, on the left hand side in the beginning bit was uh, not doing very well, moved over to the right. I thought he was getting a bit more joy in terms of his positioning on the right-hand side. But again, whenever he got the ball to feet, the quality was absolutely missing from Kulisewski. And uh, he's in a very low moment. He hasn't. He's playing not great in the moment. Obviously, he's lost his place in the team now. I don't know if that's affecting him. But when he's come off the bench recently, he's been having a stinker, let's be honest. And I thought yesterday was probably the worst of the lot, to be honest. Yeah. And I, I, I feel for him. I totally agree, and um, it, it looked like to me a player that was struggling with confidence. Um, but it's obviously easy to say that, but um, he's just not making decisions quick enough at the moment. He's not acting on those decisions quick enough, and um, he needs to improve massively if he wants to get his place back in the team. Because you're looking at the likes of Timo Werner and Brennan Johnson, both playing really well at the moment, and both providing exactly what Ant Postecoglou winger needs to provide. If you bring up this heat map of, of Timo Werner. Um, that's where you need to be. If you're on the left wing on, on an Ange system, you need to be tugging that touchline, cutting inside to, to provide those low-driven crosses um, where, where you can see on that heat map. And I think Timo Werner put in a brilliant display yesterday. I said before he was probably our most dangerous player in the first half. And in the second half, he was just a constant thorn in... Um, the Nottingham Forest side and he was getting his better of uh, the fullback time and time again and providing good um, opportunities for our players to score with. Yeah, I think Nico Williams will be having sleepless nights about uh, Timo Werner after yesterday's performance because every time he got the ball it felt like he was running at him, giving him trouble uh, and he'd he struggled to deal with him, to be honest. He just basically couldn't stop Werner getting to the byline on his left foot. And whenever B Werner got into that position, he was providing quality. As we say, got the assist for the own goal, nearly got an assist for Brennan on a couple of occasions um, and it nearly won in the second half as well. Those That quality of his left foot is something that I questioned when he first came here and, and was as well in his earlier performances. I was questioning whether he has that ability on his left foot to consistently be putting those crosses across the face of goal. But he's proven me wrong at the moment because he got a brilliant assist. And I think if you take into account own goals and you take into account that assist he got through Doggy where... Uh, it probably pretty much was a um, assist for Werner. It was just a bit lucky that um, a doggy had a shot that it. it was blocked in the fell to him and he scored. It was pretty much another assist for Werner. That's two goals and, f and five assists in eight starts now for Timo Werner. That's seven goal contributions in eight starts. So he's really providing consistently. Last few weeks as well, it seems to be very, very difficult to stop. Uh, it seems as though like everyone knows what he's going to do, but they can't really stop it at the moment. And I can't really complain because that's all we want from him. And he's doing exactly what Ange wants him to. And he's providing a really good um, outlet on, on his left foot, on the left wing, staying wide. And he's getting assists. I don't think he's, like, doing anything special. He's doing simple things very effectively. And that's exactly what we need him to do. And I'll tell you what, like, we've been... A bit critical of Timo Werner on this channel in terms of when we're talking about do we want him to be here next year and uh, I think we've both been in agreement like a lot of times when we've spoken about it in various videos saying nah I think we need someone better than Timo but I think you've mentioned it as well in some of the videos saying that if we if we sign Timo and another left winger uh, to combat him as well I think that would be a very good options to have for next season I, I don't think I was in agreement with you but I think looking at him now looking at his previous performances now looking at his time at Tottenham as a whole he's growing on me week by week he's growing on me and it's not just what he's doing well it's also his mentality on the football pitch the way he's kind of ingrained himself in the um, the team as well I just think he looks like a really settled player and he's probably in his best moment for a couple of years now um, in his career I think so, and he seems very happy. You see, after the game, he's dancing with Vicario, and he's uh, he feels really, really big part of the team at the moment. He's got such a great relationship with all all his teammates, which is an important aspect. And I think as well, 
the way the the kind of player he is, the way he plays, I think he does. He could have a value next season, uh, especially as a squad player and filling in in some games in midweek or even Champions League games. He's got Champions League experience as well, and also off the bench against tired legs, where you you can even see at the moment he's getting assists at the start where you know the fullback should have fresh legs uh, to deal with him and he's able to get to the byline consistently and get those crosses in imagine him next season if we have I don't know who it is let's say we have like an Nico Williams on the left wing tiring out a defender then they've got Timo Werner to come on and even though you know what Timo Werner is going to do defenders are just finding it very very difficult to stop that and that's all you need him to do those really simple things really effectively and at 15 million I mean you can't really go too much wrong the only problem I would have is if we sign him and we use that as a justification to not really go big on another winger yeah. that's what I'd be disappointed in because I don't think as much as I love Timo I think I, I really like him as a person I think he's been a really good player for us I don't think as a, as a winger to be relied upon as our first choice winger is going to take us to the next level even from what I'm seeing now as much as he's good um, I don't know if that's going to be good enough to take us to where we want to be, which is really challenging that top three. But as a squad player, as a player who could effectively come on as a sub and fill in in certain games, I think he's more than good enough, to be honest, uh, from what I'm seeing at the moment. Because he's the reason is he's doing exactly what Ange wants him to. And if he can listen to what Ange wants and, and put it into practice, that's all I can ask for. Yeah, absolutely. And Brennan Johnson on the other side, if you bring up his heat map as well. Um, this is what I was talking about at the Luton game, about the you know the positions that each of these players occupy. And when Kulisevsky does start on the right-hand side, he's cutting in way too much. And that's not a hallmark. That's not what Ange Postacoglu wants to see from his winger. This is what he wants to see from his winger. Really at, um, stay wide, provide options, provide quality. And I think Brennan Johnson's doing this from time and time again. A, a couple of times he got on the ball and started attacking his back and, and got the better of him on a number of occasions. On another day, you're probably talking about T, uh, Brennan Johnson ending the game with a golden assist um, mm. with what he showed on it. I don't think it was his best performance by any stretch of the imagination, but he was a th constant threat. He exactly. He still was involved. He should have scored that goal where Timo laid on a plate for him. There was that one moment again in the second half, which I pointed out. He, for one reason or another, he just decided not to gamble at the back post, and he knew he should have in that moment. And uh, he probably cost himself a goal by not gambling. But there was one moment I want to pick out, which I think, which I picked out actually on Tuesday, and he did it again in this game. And this was he got the ball on the right hand side, and in, and instead of I, I think. Um, the uh, defender was like getting prepared to show him to for him to like burst down the line, and instead of doing that, he actually s spotted a gap in the centre and he burst centrally um, and 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 kind of went um, horizontal instead of just go, uh, running vertically. He actually um, ran horizontally right across the penalty area and exploited that space and laid on a chance for uh, Hume Min Son who uh, hit the post. And that is something he's going to have to add to his uh, repertoire if he's going to become this winger who's a bit more unpredictable. Because yes, we know he. He's so quick and he can get to the byline very, very effectively and has a good delivery. But once he shows a propensity to also go inside and um, kind of run at his defenders that way, then he's going to become a lot harder to stop because all of a sudden defenders are not going to go, what, what, we're not going to know which direction he's going and what way to go. And he's becoming, in the last two games, from what I've seen, he's becoming a lot more effective at running inside, not just outside as well. Obviously, the next stage is being able to cut inside and shoot. We haven't really seen too much of that. He usually tries to pro be a provider at the moment. And that's that's fine as long as he's being effective. And I feel like he is at the moment. Um, but I want to see more displays of that finishing ability we saw at Forrest because we know he's got a good shot on him. We know he's got a good finish. And we haven't quite seen that. At Although he's got a few goals, it's more from the runs he's been making rather than you know the uh, good quality Stick finishes, finishing, yeah. which apart from the one against um, Villa, the only time we've really seen that finishing ability from him. So I want to see more from that. But I like he's becoming a bit more unpredictable and he's still doing those things that Ange wants to do, which is running at the back post and obviously taking on his man and whipping those uh, across, the, across the face of goal. So he's looking that he's improving uh, week on week. I wouldn't say this was an improvement, but it was, I felt... Um, just sustaining a good level of performance from him. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm really happy with Brendan Johnson. I'm really happy with Timo Werner, what they're providing for the team at the moment. Um, I guess, yeah, uh, that's that's what it is. The game was 3-1. It was a good victory for Spurs. I would say comfortable for the most part, apart from a few moments in the game where we probably should have done better from. But I want to finish off talking about where 
we might think Spurs are at at the moment? Because I'm seeing a lot of kind of criticism to Ange, criticism to Spurs about maybe not blowing away teams week in, week out. And maybe Spurs fans maybe got a bit too ahead of themselves after the first 10 games. But I'm looking at the team and looking where we're at, looking at everything that we had to go through. And I couldn't be happier with maybe where Spurs are at right now into the top four in Ange's first season after losing Harry Kane, a, a pretty much a completely new 11 to start the season with as well. And I can't, if, if I want to compare it to another team, I'm looking at this Spurs team where we're at, maybe very comparable to maybe the Arsenal team that finished fifth when we pipped them to fourth in that season. And I'm looking at the Spurs team and I'm seeing a lot of progression going forward. Yes, maybe we're not as good as the first 10 games of the season, but it was always going to be hard. You're looking at what we've done this season, unbeaten this season so far with our starting first choice back four, uh, which is unbelievable to think about that. And in terms of the home form this season, yes, we went on a dodgy run when the injuries first came with the West Ham, the Villas and, and the Wolves. But our home form has been impeccable apart from that. You know, we've only lost Wolves apart from in that little period. So I think Spurs fans should be really happy with the direction that this team are going in right now. Yeah, no, I know. I'm not really sure what more Spurs fans expect at this current point in Ange's tenure. We're, eight, we're seven months in now. Um, we're in the top into the top four. We're adding a bit more consistency in terms of how we approach games. Yes, within game, we do sometimes, well, often, I would say, struggle to have real control over 90 minutes for the whole game. And so we are letting the opposition maybe in a few too many times than maybe we should. And some some of the chances we concede are maybe a bit too uh, good a quality. But nothing's going to be perfect at, at this point in time. We're not going to be this perfect, well-oiled team uh, like prime Barcelona, like after seven months. It's never going to happen. Even with, you know, the best team in the world, it's, it's going to be very, very difficult to get to those levels that quickly. And to get to the level that we're at as quickly as we have, for me, is very, very impressive. I think Ange has got this group together uh, in a really impressive way. Clearly, everyone... Is, uh, is, feel, is a family feel. You see how everyone gets on with each other. But it's not just that. I think the football that we play, when we're, when we're on it and when we're, we're free-flowing, we're very, very difficult to stop. And that's not easy to get, even at this point in time. Uh, it's very, very difficult to even get to that stage so quickly. And I see some of the football we play is an absolute delight to watch. Yes, there are points where... Obviously, teams are going to come and try and stop you. They're, they're going to study us. They're going to see how we play. They're going to try and stop us. And a lot of the time at the moment, in first halves, that is happening. But sometimes the game has to play out to know what you've got to do to win the game, if you know what I mean. Sometimes when the game plays out, you have to see what the opposition are doing. You have to see how they're, um, how they're kind of uh, taking to the game, how they're appro approaching the game, sorry, is the better term for it. And then you figure out what you guys need to do to get over that opposition, get over that challenge. And at the moment, in these first halves, we're, we're having a lot of challenges at the moment. Teams are coming out in certain ways to try and stop us and getting some joy in some ways. But the most important thing is, in the second half, we rectify those situations and we end up on top. We end up winning the game. And that's not easy to do. That's a lot easier said, um, uh, said than done, I should say. And I think people are taking these wins for granted, taking this consistency for granted, winning eight of the last nine home games. They're just taking that for granted as, as if that's very, very easy to do at this level in time what well, actually it's very very difficult to do and a lot of team most teams at this stage of their tenure don't have anywhere near the level of consistency we're showing at the moment and yes we are benefiting from a lack of european football and a bit of a freshness and all these kind of different things but to be in the top four um, to score the level of goals we have at this point in time is very very impressive yes we should all strive for better we should all not rest until we, we are this perfect team and there are problems of course there are problems we haven't had that consistency since the first 10, 10 games even when we've had our best 11 fit it hasn't quite been the same level of control we showed in those games but I think people take for granted how difficult it is uh, to get to those levels and how difficult it is to be in the stage that we are at the moment. And I think, look, when you look at it, the season as a whole at the moment, you pretty much, if it wasn't for that terrible run after the Chelsea game, or even in, the, in that period, there should have been games we should have won where we were very unfortunate. Like, we would, have, we would be right up there challenging the top three right now if it wasn't for that run where we lost four and four and five games. So we're really not that far away in terms of how we're playing. I'm sure next season's going to be even different sets and more sets of challenges once you're in Europe. We have to handle that as well. So who who's to say 
come next season where we are going to be at. We don't know. It depends on signings we make and all that kind of stuff. But I honestly, I agree. I think we're in a really great position. I think the progress has been unbelievable. And if we're progressing this quickly right now, Imagine another summer, even more time, uh, and with the players. Imagine more time for him to kind of reshuffle the squad, knowing who fits the system, who doesn't. More time to get players he wants in the, into the team. I think we're going to fly, and I think the not only the fan I feel that I think the players feel that as well. The way they're speaking, and I think that's the most important thing. And I'm just talking about look, yes, I'm you know. I see progress, but I'm looking at the title challenge. I'm not going to be happy until we're challenging for a title. And that's the mentality already that our squad is having. Yeah, absolutely spot on. And you're looking at, you know, 11 points behind the top right now, right? Behind Arsenal. And how many points do you reckon we actually dropped because of this mad injury crisis that we do have? I reckon it's maybe not as much as 11, but definitely around that ballpark figure. So if you take that injury crisis away, yeah, I know like every team are going to deal with injuries and going to have injuries. And it's how you kind of use the squad to get the best out of um, and get the consistent results. And we didn't have that squad this season. Once we do have this squad and we can uh, kind of cope with these injuries, you're going to see a much different uh, team and a much more consistent team. And I do think that if these injuries didn't happen, like you're saying, we would be much closer to the top than we are now. And I think we're equal points in front of Man United now and behind Arsenal. And to be at this stage, to be in fourth, to be... like If I told you at the beginning of the season, with seven games to go, we'll be only 11 points behind the top. Mm. You would have thought I'm crazy, like losing Harry Kane and and uh, a new manager and a new system and be- trying to bed in a whole completely new 11 in one season. You would have thought I was crazy. So to be 11 points behind with the injury crisis that we've had already this season as well, I, I think you can only take your hat off to Ange Postacoglu and, and the players as well uh, for the way they've dealt with everything uh, that have come their way. So... I think the the running's tough, though. (laughs) The the run, look, yeah, yeah. fine. The running is tough, and whatever happens, happens. But to be where we are right now, with seven games to go in this position, I think is nothing short of miraculous. Yeah, and I think we're going to be relishing these last few games. I know you could argue we are struggling to beat the likes of Forest and Luton. We're only just getting over the line, but it's a different challenge. It's a different game. These game, these uh, teams against Liverpool City and Arsenal that we have got coming up, these are teams going for the title. They're not going to be playing the way that Forest and Luton. Uh, and West Ham play. They're going to be playing in a completely different way. And we've seen earlier in the season that we like play- teams playing that way. Yes, I'm sure they'll be, we'll concede chances, but we're also going to create chances and we're going to relish that challenge. And I'm sure I wouldn't be surprised if we pull off some some surprise results. Yeah, I'm sure we're not going to win all three. And I'm sure it's, that, you know there'll be some games maybe we lose, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's some shock results in there. Yeah, uh, me as well. And everyone goes to me like, oh, yeah, but uh, every team gets injuries. No, Nobody has coped with an injury crisis as Spurs have. Look at Man United. They've had a similar amount of injury crisis all season. We're 11 points behind them. What did they finish? Third last season? Mm-hmm. Um, look at Newcastle. Finished fourth last season. They've had a similar amount of injury crisis to us. Look at them. They're mid-table, sitting around 10th or 9th, mm-hmm. wherever they are. So it's incredible the job that Andrew Postcoglu has done. And um, yeah, I think we'll leave it there. But I think... I think uh, people need to stop going so overboard of the negativity about how Spurs are going and the direction Spurs are going and, oh, we're going to lose this game, we're going to lose that game. Like Things are going great at the moment and um, you need to realise where you're at as a football club and this is where we're at right now. Um, mm-hmm. And to be challenging for fourth and in fourth with uh, seven games to go, I think is a brilliant testament to Ange, uh, like I said. So that is your match review and a bit of an insight into where we think the club is at at the moment as well. We've got a couple of super chats here. One from Andrew Din saying, can we confirm the magic of the South Stand we scored so many goals when we played mm. forward towards the South Southland in the second half. Maybe it's that Southland sucking in the goal. Yeah, honestly, it's, we seem to up our game when we perform against the South Stand. So maybe there is something special about it. Is it the new um, the new cop end? Like, Better uh, than the cop. It's an the upgrade. Cop's dead. The cop's dead now. So. Exactly. It's an upgrade. Um, THFC Till I Die saying, keep up the great content lags. Come on, you Spurs. And uh, they've been a member for 11 months. A big up to THFC Till I Die. And I saw another comment as well. Um, let me try find it from LLC Vlogs, I think it was, saying, Sim, I saw you in the South Stand yesterday. So uh, Big up. <laughs> um, I saw a few people. But nice to see you at the stadium, it says. It was nice to see you too, I'm sure. 
<laughs> uh, but let's get into the player ratings. We're going to start off with Big Vic, and Sim gives him an eight. I gave him a seven. Um, he was actually brilliant yesterday. A really important save, particularly in that second half um, when he tipped it on where Wood had a open goal pretty much and bashed it along the post. But a number of good saves, and I thought he used his box uh, really well and commanded his box really well. So big up to Vic. Yeah, and I think from set pieces as well, he was pretty strong. Um, yeah, that save from Yates was the crucial moment. If that goes in, then we're in big, big trouble. So it was a fantastic one-handed save and had to make himself big for that um, Wood miss as well. Um, might try and make it as difficult as possible, however hard that is. And I thought he had a really good display. I was really happy with him. And crucial saves at crucial moments. And that's been the story of Vicario season. Pedro Porro up next, Sim gives him an eight. I gave him a seven. I was actually quite disappointed with Pedro in the first half. I thought out of position a couple of times, defensively a tiny bit poor. Uh, but in the second half, I thought he grew massively. He was a key part to why we were so dominant and going forward and obviously got a great goal as well. So uh, big up to Pedro. Yeah, um, I thought much better in the second half yet again. I thought um was really effective. I thought there was that one moment he got caught out in the first half through a... Uh, uh, Ole Aina got in behind him and obviously set up that chance for Yates. But other than that, I thought he dealt with Hudson Odoi pretty effectively. I thought Hudson Odoi had very little apart from he had one shot on target, which was easily saved from Vicario. And then in the second half, I thought he was much more involved, getting to the byline, getting some really good deliveries into the box. And obviously a brilliant strike, which uh, put us 3 one up as well. Needs to be doing more of that. We know how good he is with his uh, ability in front of goal. So I want to see more goals from Poro. But I thought in the end had a really good display. Cootie Romero, eights all round for Cootie. I thought another uh, really good display. And a lot of these good displays from Cootie are going under the radar at the moment. And I think the way he is so calm and measured at the back, as well as adding that aggress aggressivity in his game as well, he was very unlucky not to stop the goal that we did concede. And he just does everything, um, you know, strong at the back, brings the ball into the midfield, ball playing ability. I mean, I think this guy is a top, top player. And I don't think he's getting the credit he deserves this season. Yeah. I think his passing is sensational. I think that that's something that doesn't get talked about enough. He's one of the best passers out the back in the whole league, in my opinion. I thought he had another phenomenal performance on that display. I thought he was actually really aerially dominant. Um, a lot of uh, long balls played to Chris Wood, which he dealt with really, really well and made sure that Chris Wood wasn't getting um, the joy that maybe he has done previously. Five out of five aerial duels won. Well, there you go. I thought he was very dominant in the air. Um, and he sets us up on attack so well. Um, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. So, fantastic display from uh, Kuti Romero. And as you say, I think because Van der Ven makes those like lung bursting challenges in behind, like they're, they're very, very obvious and evident. But Romero does like these little t uh, tackles where he just wins possession without you barely noticing. And they're not as uh, well publicized, let's say. Yeah. And the only thing that gets publicized with Kuti Romero is when he makes an error. Yeah. Like that's the only thing that people talk about with Kuti. And, no, but, and they don't uh, give him the props when he deserves it. And it seems like week in, week out, he's putting in like quietly unbelievable displays, mm -hmm. uh, Kuti. So big up to him. Next up is Mickey van der Ven, our man in the match on the day. Nines all round. I thought it was an unbelievable display even before he got that goal. Um, putting out fires. There was one moment when Callum hudson Adoy looked like he was all but in and suddenly Mickey van der Ven just appears out of nowhere and just calmly just takes the ball off him. Uh, time and time again, he was putting in uh, last minute ditch challenges uh, that really kind of stopped um, uh, forest attacks or potential forest attacks and obviously that goal as well. Uh, someone had to ha take a dig at that point and it was Mickey van de Ven and he rifled it into the top corner a sensational effort from him yeah best player on the park even without the goal uh, the goal just tapped it off uh, the amount of recoveries he makes is astonishing if it wasn't for van de Ven I do feel like our defense would be a lot more exposed than it is he's just a phenomenon with his ability to track back and and make sure that there's a uh, there doesn't come a chance from moments where there would have been a big chance so unbelievable from uh, from him and um I thought it was an unbelievable display. He'd barely put a foot wrong. He was quite out of position a bit for the goal, I would say. Obviously, he comes over and uh, uh, has to try and make up for a doggy being out of position. But I thought it was a phenomenal display from him. And uh, obviously, that goal capped off. And who knew he had uh, 25 yarders in him as well? Yeah, unreal. Udogi up next. Sim gives him a six. I gave him a seven. I thought he was struggling in the first half. Uh, you could see that he was completely out of position for the first goal, uh, which led to a whole heap of problems at the back and a lot of space being um, kind of utilised by Nottingham Forest. Um, and again, time and time again, he was getting the the Forest uh, right 
on the right side were getting the better of him in terms of Nico Williams and Alanga. But I do think he massively improved in the second half. Um, I thought he was back to his kind of usual self, bulldozing runs forward and also um, quite solid at the back. I don't think anything got past him in that second half. So I gave him a point, um, an extra point just for that second half performance. Yeah, it was definitely much better in the second half. I was linking up really well with Timo Werner actually on occasion. Werner was, I, li- I really enjoy it when um, the ball p- is played quickly to Werner. He does a little um, delicate flick into Udogi who then bursts into space like a it's like a relay team in, in that aspect I really enjoy that those those things where they do it I did think Elanga gave him a tough time to be honest I think throughout the game I thought he was struggling to contain him uh, did a better job of it in the first half in the second half sorry than in the first half obviously was caught out badly for the goal in the first half and I thought Elanga was getting some joy out of him by and large um, he did pretty well uh, come the second half but again I don't think he's been in the best form actually Destiny so wasn't his best game again yeah Pat Mate Sar up next Sim gives him a six I gave him a five got taken off at half time and I think rightly so because I just don't think he was at the races uh, to be fair in that first half a very uncharacteristic performance from Pat Mate Sar um, off the ball he was a bit of a liability and um, it got a lot better when he went off yeah, again, lacked a bit of buy, lacked a bit of aggression that we associate with Pat Matissa. As uh, your favourite phrase, he covered every blade of grass. He wasn't quite doing that um, yesterday, unfortunately. He did have a few moments. I remember there was one high overturn which he caused, which uh, put Spurs on the attack, and we nearly benefited from it. But I think it was more off the ball what he was doing in terms of the defensive transitions, just allowing Gibbs White way too much, um, uh, way too much influence in the game, and he was uh, kind of buzzing around and causing uh, a lot of problems for Spurs. And we just weren't getting close enough to Forrest when they were in those attacking transitions, especially in the second half of the first half. And uh, unfortunately, he got he got hooked for it. So I think on the ball, he was OK. But I think his lack of intensity off the ball uh, is what cost him. Bissouma up next. Him gives him a five. I gave him a six. And it was like such a weird half from Bissouma because he's another one that got hooked at half time. But I thought first 20 minutes, he was brilliant. And, and the last 20 minutes, he was absolutely shocking. Uh, so it was hard to rate him, to be honest, because first half, he was doing everything that you want him to do. Strong in defence, driving forward, taking shots, uh, being a thorn in their side. And the second half... He was nowhere to be seen. He completely let his standards drop. Um, Off the ball, he was terrible. He kept um, getting caught out of position as well. I mean, it was just shocking those last 20 minutes. But the first 20 minutes, I thought he was really good. Yeah, um, I thought he started off really well, was... uh getting to really good attacking positions obviously heavily involved in the first goal as well a couple of really nice passes in the build-up which led to obviously Timo Werner um, getting the assist for the first goal but again just like Saar I thought it was what he was doing more off the ball than it was on the ball because I thought in defensive transitions he was caught cold and nowhere to be seen and it was lack of positioning not being aware of the danger and on a couple of occasions it led to Nottingham Forest obviously first getting the goal and then having a really good chance to make it 2-1 as well I thought Basuma was kind of just being languid wasn't getting involved wasn't being aware of the danger and that's what led him to being hooked uh, at the break I thought he lacked a bit of bite in the middle as well and Hoybier came on and changed that so really good from Basuma Uh, sorry really good in the beginning but unfortunately that lack of aggression intensity really cost him as well. A bit similar to Star, so had to be hooked. Yeah. Madison up next. Sim gives him a six. I gave him a seven. I thought he was poor in the first half. Didn't see anywhere close uh, to what we need from James Madison. But I do think he improved in that second half. He was a contributor um, quite a few times. Four key passes on the day, which shows you that he still has that output level and obviously was heavily involved in that third goal as well with a lovely cross into Bentancor, who nicely guided it to the back post of Pedro Porro. So I do think Madison improved. And it's a weird one because like he had, he'll probably having his... Uh, best part of the game as he was getting taken off very similar to the West Ham game yeah I thought he had an influence obviously Yates was surrounding him like a rash every time he got the ball he was fouling him uh, very consistently uh, and that also is an indication of how Yates was struggling to deal with him but as well that little punch from Madison uh, which I marked him down for a bit because he lost his head and couldn't get himself sent off and gave the VAR a decision to make and that if that moment goes against Spurs, you know, that could have easily cost Spurs points in this game and that would have been very, very frustrating. I think in general, obviously he did make an impact, 
was creating a few uh, chances, heavily involved in the third goal with a really good ball into Ben Tenkor, heavily involved in the first goal, so he could build up play into Hume Min Son. So there were some really good moments from him. Still not those sprinkles of magic that we know he's capable of. Madison said after the game he feels like he's getting back to his best, but he's not quite there yet. And uh, let's hope in the last uh, seven games of the season we do see him back to his best. Yeah. Let's move on to Hyung Min Son. Sevens all round for Sonny. Um, look, I thought it was a good display. Nothing miraculous from Sonny, but, uh, you know, involved in two of the goals. First goal, he was involved with the nice pass out wide to uh, Timo Werner. And the second goal, he obviously played it to uh, Mickey van der Ven, who rifled it into the top corner and could have got a goal on the, on the day as well with the uh, keeper providing a nice save and uh, pushing it onto the post. So I think he was heavily involved in our good moments. Uh, he non-stop running and non-stop energy like you know you're going to get from Sonny. Sonny, but um, it's always hard for him against these kind of low block teams. Yeah, I agree. And obviously he did have that one moment, as you say, which he did hit the post and that would have capped off a, a nice display from him. But he did struggle to kind of get into those goal scoring positions. And that was a frustration for him. But again, in his build up play, I thought it was pretty good. As you say, he was really good in the build up for the first goal. Nice little pass to, to Van der Ven for the second, although you know, it is a simple pass, but you have to find it and the way of pass has to be correct. And I did feel like when he's coming into those deeper positions, Forrest not, weren't really sure what to do, whether to go towards him or just stay in their position. I think by and large, they did just stay and let him have it. I thought he was uh, fitted in and out of the game. When he was in it, he was dangerous. But when he was out of it, um, it was hard for him to, to impact the game. <laughs> he did move over to the left-hand side uh, late in the game. And I felt like uh, wasn't um, maybe at his best on the left-hand side either. So... I thought he contributed positive, positively enough to get a seven, but obviously when, with the player like Son, you want to see him involved more. Mm. Brennan Johnson, sevens all round as well. Um, look, I thought he was a threat for pretty much most of the game. He was getting the ball, he was being aggressive, he was attacking his fullback, and he got the better of him on a number of times. On another day, uh, he could have ended up with the goal and assist. Obviously, it was his pass to Sonny, which, uh, you know, where the keeper pushed it out to the post. And um, he could have got a goal as well when he was uh, in the right area for that Timo Werner cross so he just couldn't put it past the keeper yeah and I think he's becoming a bit more unpredictable in terms of uh, that assist he nearly had for Son who at the post was a brilliant run inside rather than just consistently going on the outside could have got a goal which uh, with, wasn't for a really good save from Matt Sales right inside the six-year-old box should have been finishing that he'll be disappointed he'll be disappointed on a couple of occasions he didn't um, get a finish on one of those team over and crosses but I thought he impacted the game really positively he was constantly an option I think one of his crosses as well was deflected onto the crossbar as well so had a really uh, dangerous moment there and he was a constant threat so he was good uh, again impacted the game positively but he'll be disappointed he didn't get a goal contribution on the day Timo Werner last of the starting 11 we gave him an 8 all round and um, yeah he was the most threatening of our attacking trio that we had on the day obviously he's the one that put the cross in for the own goal in the first half moments later he puts in a carbon copy cross that finds Brennan Johnson where he probably should be doing better and I just thought he was a constant thorn um, in the side uh, of Nottingham Forest and you know the right back just couldn't deal with him pretty much on the day and he was getting the better of him time and time again and this is what we need from Timo Werner just to keep attacking keep attacking keep attacking and I think that's exactly what he did. Yeah, and I think Nico Williams really struggled to deal with him. He knew every time he got the ball, he was going to go down to the left-hand side and he just couldn't stop it. And what I liked about Timo is every time he did get to the byline, more often than not, it was a really good delivery, obviously, for the own goal, for the Brennan Johnson chance, for the he flashed one across the face of goal, which Johnson didn't gamble on. He also put one across the face of goal, which Johnson went with his, uh, with his went for a high foot instead of, his, instead of a header as well. That could have been a good opportunity. So delivery is getting a lot more consistent with Timo Werner. So I'm really, really happy about that. Um, obviously, someone who scored the amount of goals he did in Germany you'd like to see him getting a few more goal scoring positions he was he's obviously much more focused on assisting in, in this current system but as long as he's assisting consistently I don't mind so really really positive from Timo Werner and um, the, how he stretches the play is really really effective and at the moment he's our most dangerous player so absolutely brilliant from him Substitutes, going to start off with Rodrigo Bentancourt, who came on at half-time. Eights all round for Rodri, and I, I thought he showed his best self uh, yesterday, Rodrigo. He came on, provided an impact, grabbed himself an assist with a lovely header to the back post of Pedro Porro. But he just produced that calm in the middle, that drive in the middle as well, and he just impacted the game in such a positive manner. 
Yeah, fantastic from Bentacle. Great cameo. Um, played well for the whole half. Added that little bit of more bite, which was really, really effective in that second half. I thought his um, obviously passing was really great. His moments where he's dribbling himself out of trouble was uh, absolutely fantastic. And I thought he really li helped liven up Spurs in that second half. Obviously got an assist as well from the third goal. Lovely little flick header to the back post, which I do think he meant on reflection. Uh, really uh, cleverly guided into Porro's path. Uh, so uh, he had a free shot. And I thought it was a really good cameo from him, a really good second half performance. And maybe with a view of potentially starting at St. James's Park on the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. And you're really starting to see him now uh, put those injury woes behind him and, and start to see the Bentang core that we know and love from... Uh, before the ACL, basically, when he was one of the best midfielders in the Premier League at that point. So uh, big up to Rodrigo Bentancourt. Next up, Pierre Emil Hoybier. Seven from Sim, eight from me. Raised a few eyebrows at halftime when you saw uh, Pierre Emil Hoybier uh, warming up in front of uh, you know the stadium by himself. And um, I thought he provided a really good option. He sat in the base of the six, and I thought um, he did everything that was asked of him really well. He started to even take shots as well. I think four shots. Um, in the day and there was even a moment where after he took a shot every time he got the ball the Spurs fans started shouting, <laughs> shouting shoot and uh, he obliged on a few occasions but um, no nah, I thought he uh, was really good and provided the reason why we went on and had such a strong display in that second half driving force in the middle of the park as well but it does come with a few down points as well because I thought after those good those good moments in the last 15 minutes he did let a standard slip a few times and um, Nottingham Forest nearly got a goal from it yeah I thought he made a really positive impact he really helped change the game I thought he again added that bit of bite in the centre, winning some really good, ta really good important tackles, which we weren't winning in the in the in the first half, which allowed Nottingham Forest to progress up the pitch. And obviously, he was a big part of why we got the three-one lead, allowing us to sustain that pressure, allowing us to kind of put the boot on Forest's throat. Unfortunately. As you say, in those last uh, 15 minutes, he played a suicidal blind pass across the face of goal, which gave it straight to Alanga, which we were lucky they didn't score from. And I thought his passing just started to get really, really sloppy and I started to get really frustrated with him. So unfortunately, he did get downgraded a mark for that, uh, which is why I didn't give him as good as Ben Tancor. But look, the good outweighed the bad, thankfully for us. And we were 3-1 up with a large part to him. So I want to give him the credit. But... I don't know why in those last 15 minutes he started to get really, really sloppy and it didn't allow Forrest back into the game nearly. Dejan Kulisevsky up next. Falls all round from Deki, which carries on his poor run of form at the moment. Um, he just looks like a man playing without confidence. Started off on the left-hand side, uh, moved over as well at some point during the um, last 15, 20 minutes. He was on the pitch and every time he got the ball, just seemed to wait uh, make wait, take way too long to make his decisions every time um, the move broke down when he did get the ball and it was really frustrating to see him on the pitch to be fair yeah I had a bit of a stinker um, I feel for him because he looks like a guy who's trying things and he's 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 definitely not like um, he's trying his best is what I'm trying to say and and at the moment, nothing's coming off for him. I don't know if it's a confidence issue or I don't know if it's a reaction to him, you know, being left out of the team last few games. But his last two cameos have been pretty woeful. And every time he's tried something, it hasn't come off. Um, he's had some really good, actually, opportunities as well. It's not like he hasn't had chances. He has. And he's wasted pretty much every single one of them at the moment. Hasn't been able to create a chance or get a shot off himself on any occasion. Keeps giving the ball away very, very cheaply. Um, so hopefully that changes uh, sooner rather than later. But it's been uh, really, really really poor last uh, couple of games for him. And the last player that we are going to rate is Giovanni Lo Celso. Sim gives him a seven. I gave him a six. And I actually thought he was bright when he came on. He always got on the ball, looked to make stuff happen. Uh, just nothing did happen uh, from the moments that he did provide. So he was looking energetic. He was looking positive. But... Um, nothing really did happen from his good play. Yeah, bright cameo. If, he, if Kulusevsky was a bit better, he might have been on the end of, a, of an assist if Kulusevsky could have been a bit more effective in the final third. Obviously, earned a free kick on the edge of the box as well where Danilo definitely should have been sent off. So he got a big whack on the knee with a Danilo stud. So that looked like a painful one for Lascelles. So thankfully, he got up from it and he didn't stay injured, which we know Lascelles can do. Um, yeah, I thought it was a bright cameo and allowed us to see out of the game.
And he, also uh, Dane Scarlett, we didn't mention. Yeah, Dane Scarlett came in the last few minutes. He looked quite aggressive, uh, Dane. I thought he did pretty well. Uh, there was one moment, one really nice ball he played around the back. I can't remember who mm. it was for. Um, but that was pretty much uh, the extent of his cameo. There was one moment where if Kulu had a better pass on him, Scarlett was there mm. waiting at the back post. But unfortunately, this pass got cut out. So... I wasn't to be. Yeah, it obviously wasn't too much. I think he only came on in the 89th minute, I think. Yeah. So wasn't didn't have too much time. But it was nice to see him on the pitch. And maybe yeah. from now to end season, might start to get a few opportunities. Yeah, like I hope to. so. I hope so. Um, but also, just one thing I wanted to mention, that free kick that you mentioned before. That why? What do we have yeah. to get Sonny to take a free kick? Why is Hoybier taking that free kick? And I don't know if you saw it in the replay. Like, Hoybier and Sonny are like, Hoybier was like, nah, this is mine. And Sonny's like, nah, come on, let me take it. And Hoybier's like, no, no, this is mine. Like, Sonny is the captain why is Hoybier calling the shots at that moment Sonny, in time? Sonny should be putting his foot down I'm sorry as much I love Son maybe at that point he's a bit too much of a people pleaser because he's got to put his foot down saying look I'm the one banging free kicks every bloody week for Korea I'm taking this free kick yeah. and not allow Hoybier to step in and then Hoybier goes and hits the wall with a terrible effort so don't understand it we get so few free kicks it seems in those, in those positions like Sonny has to start taking a few of them so yeah it's very frustrating. And I was like, when I saw that back, I was like, Sonny, you need to be stronger than that, man. Mm -hmm. You need to be stronger than that. You can't be letting Hoybier take a free kick in a scoring position. Like, it's just not on. But anyway, we finish off with Ange Postacoglu. Sevens all round for Big Ange. Um, again, same issues. You know, we don't um, assert ourselves properly in the first half or we concede way too many chances. But and this time he did recognise the flaws and he did make the changes positively to impact that game in the second half. And then we run out deserved victors. So um, some good, some bad in there from Ange. But I think he made the changes to positively impact the game. Yeah, practice substitutions. That's the main thing. We did lose our way a bit in the first half, albeit we did again start really well. We maybe could have been 2 nil up before we conceded. And that would have been very, very positive. So he definitely had the team coming out firing. Unfortunately, uh, we do lose our way and, you know, the team have to learn from that. But as you say, practice substitutions and I think we're the best team in the league at scoring between 45 and 60 I think we score a lot of our goals just after half time uh, at the moment I think off the top of my head you know Brentford we scored three Brighton we scored one uh, I think Luton we uh, we scored one as well uh, in that kind of period so I don't know what it is about half time but we do come out uh, with a lot of energy in that second half and and uh, change the game really positively good subs and manage the game really well yeah all right, well, that is our player ratings. Let me know if you agree with our ratings. If not, put your ratings in the comments section below. We're going to move on to the five takeaways. We're going to take a look at the game and see what five things we can take away from the 3-1 win over Nottingham Forest. And the first one we're going to be looking at is Mickey, class above. Yeah, and he was... Definitely a class above in this game. Man of the match performance from him. It wasn't just the goal, though. Uh, the stats read for himself. Five out of five ground duels. Three out of five aerial duels. Three out of four long passes as well. Five tackles, which is not something you actually associate with Van der Ven because usually he's not in a position where he has to make so many tackles. But he made five in this game, which shows he's a bit more aggressive and one interception. And one thing I want to actually point out of Van der Ven is something I've criticised him for uh, in weeks gone past past is his passing and his um, effective passing going forward I feel like sometimes it takes too long and it's not crisp enough or effective enough and I thought that really improved actually uh, on the uh, on the weekend he was playing it really quickly into Werner really effectively a lot crisper as well so it seems as though maybe his passing is going up, uh, up another level as well and obviously scored the winner as well yeah, and to, to bed in to the team as quickly as he has done, pretty much from the first week in a Spurs shirt. Um, nothing short of spectacular from Mickey van der Ven in this game. Completely right. He was a cut above the rest. He was a class above the rest. And um, that goal proved it. What a bloody finish that was uh, from a centre-back uh, who's not known for his shooting ability whatsoever. To rifle that in the top corner um, and send the stadium into pandemonium uh, was only what his performance deserved on the day. Um, He's just a he's just a great player to watch. Like from a defensive standpoint, the speed that he has and the recovery runs that he makes, he's just a joy to behold to watch week in, week out. And I feel like we're so lucky to have him and the 
partnership he's providing with him and Kuti Romero at the back is nothing short of sensational. And also, I was looking at the stats yesterday and you put that Chelsea game aside. He's only been in one losing Spurs side in the Premier League, which mm. was the game against Wolves. And if you want to be really harsh, there's two losing sides if in the game against Man City in the Cup as well. So, and that was one of his first games back, I think, from uh, after the injury. So, um, you, the stats clearly say we're a much, 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 much better team and much more, um, you know, focused team with Mickey van der Ven in the side. Mm. So, what a player he is. What a player. Let's move on to number two, and that is Werner provides again. Yeah. Um, won't officially get an assist for the own goal, but I'm going to give it to him because it was a brilliant... Uh, so unfair, that. Yeah, I think so. The, but with that kind of cross, you know, when you kind of force the defender to put it in, in, into his own net, I think you should be getting credit for that. And if you take own goals into account, um, Werner now has two goals and five assists in eight starts uh, for Spurs since signing in January. Uh, obviously, could have had another assist as well for Brennan Johnson if it wasn't for a really good save from Matt Sells. And he's having a really good impact now, uh, Timo Werner. Set, if you if you call it seven goal contributions in in eight starts, I, I don't think many would could, would have expected that after his um, signing in January, and he's really providing a really good um, element to the team on that left hand side. And the question the questions are now a lot of people talking: Is he earning that permanent move now to Spurs? I think he's uh, going some way to earning it. Uh, to be fair, and I was always against it, and I've been against it since probably about last week. But he's really growing on me. Uh, what he shows, what he's uh, how he's kind of ingrained himself in the team as well. He just feel like he completely fits in um, with the squad and he's showing how to implement Ange's instructions perfectly well getting wide on that pitch uh, cutting inside providing good options crossing ability and the assists and the numbers speak for itself um, if you've taken the own goals into account seven goal contributions in eight starts I think is a brilliant brilliant return for Timo Werner for someone that uh, came here with the kind of narrative of he's very frustrating when he gets on the ball in his end product well if this is him when he's frustrating seven uh, goal contributions in eight games let's see what happens when he clicks exactly so big you feel like, you feel like well, he's got more, more to give yeah, as well I think so. you know you can feel like he can Get into more, more goal scoring positions. He, he's, I know he's, a, he misses a lot of big chances, but we saw in the Bundesliga he can finish when he when he wants to. You know what I mean? Well, like on occasion he does have that finish in him. So I'd love to see him get some more goals as well. Yeah, and you know what? Players miss big chances. Timo um, Erling Haaland, how many big chances has he missed mm. this season? He's considered as the best striker in the league. Darwin Nunez, how many uh, big chances does he miss week in, week out? You know what I mean? Big players do miss big chances. It's how you um, kind of recover from that. And I feel like Timo Werner is recovering from that and he's providing a really good option for the team. So I think um, Timo Werner as well is kind of suffering from his tenure at Chelsea and maybe his second stint at Leipzig where people use that as a stick to beat with him beat him with instead of actually looking at his performances and seeing how he's providing the Spurs team with mm -hmm. all these great options mm, I agree. Um, number three is attacking defenders yeah and with Van de Ven and Porro both being on the score sheet yesterday Spurs now sit level top of the league for goals scored by defenders this season with 11 level on um, top with Arsenal who obviously scored a lot of goals from set pieces this season uh, the breakdown is Romero with four Udogi with two Van de Ven with two Porro with one one, and Ben Davis scored one earlier in the season as well. So uh, threats from all over the pitch, and that's an important thing, especially in Ange's system when it's trying to be very fluid. It's important that if our attackers are having an off day, then the defenders can provide and step up and get goals as well. And some of the bangers these defenders have scored as well. You're mm. looking at the Romero one at Burnley. You're looking at the Van der Ven one yesterday, the Porro one yesterday, Porro in the cup against Burnley as well, which is not part of the stats. I mean, some of our defenders are scoring some bangers this season and um, when you're looking at Kuti if I would have like four goals this season for Kuti which is level with Gabriel and Gabriel is like um, who marauded as like this massive goal scoring centre back and Romero nobody talks about him and he's on the same amount of goals as him so I haven't seen, I haven't seen Gabriel bang one in from 25 exactly, yards well. exactly he's just a set piece merchant Gabriel and but both our centre backs have banged one in from 25 that's yards that's what I'm out. saying <laughs> that's what I'm saying so you've got to look at the quality of the goals that our defenders are scoring and I think it's a testament to Ange and and the belief he's given these players so um, big up to these defenders and let's hope they can get us some more goals from now until the end of the season sorry you, some 
someone in the comments is right. I did miss one. Uh, Emerson against Brentford. Yeah, that's well. right. Another banger. So I was, I was, uh, so I was, um, that was 10 I counted. So that would make it 11 with the Emerson so it, one. Is that level with Arsenal? Or it one? was. I, that's count, the one I calculated goes up to 10, not 11. Oh, so I see. So I missed one, yeah. So okay. you're right. Emerson as well, which was uh, another really great finish from 25 yards. So uh, it's really great that our defenders are contributing because, you know, our attackers were having, in terms of in front of goal, having a bit of an off day yesterday. So in terms of our players that are playing week in, week out and had enough minutes, is it Basuma, the only player without a goal contribution this year? Is there um, anyone else without a goal contribution? Because Saar's got one, all the defence have one. It must be only Basuma. And our starting 11, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Everyone else has definitely got one. Which is really impressive when you're looking at last season, like it was pretty much just Kane and Son, <laughs> or pretty much just Kane uh, last season uh, providing for us week in, week out. Now we've got, and this is what we said, isn't it? Before Ange came in or when Ange came in, yeah, we're losing Kane, mm -hmm. but we're going to be getting goals from all different areas of the pitch. And that's how it's panned out to be. Yeah, absolutely. Number four, we're going to look at is home momentum. Yeah, and our... Obviously, we had that <coughs> tricky run at home just after the Chelsea game where we lost, I think, three in a row at home after taking the lead. We lost to Chelsea, lost to Villa, and then we lost to West Ham. Yeah. Uh, really Wolves. unfortunate. Uh, Wolves but I'm saying later. it was in a row. But since that West Ham game, which was uh, right beginning of the December, we've played nine home games and won eight of them. Um, sit, we now sit fourth in the overall home table as well. And considering, you know, all the talk of how good Villa's home form has been, we, now, we have now overtaken Aston Villa in the home form as well. Um, so we are building a bit of a fortress now and if it wasn't for that little run where just after the Chelsea game you know in even even in that run we should have beaten Villa we had more enough chances to win that game we probably should have beaten West Ham we gave them two goals like against run of play we were completely in control of that game so I think our home form this season we've really starting to build a bit of momentum at home a momentum now I'm still turning that home uh, um, into a bit of a fortress yeah and I always feel like at home I felt it yesterday I felt it against Luton I felt it a number of even against Brentford that there's a bit of a sense of inevitability about Spurs at home where even if we go in at half time losing or drawing you always get the feeling that you're gonna that we're gonna turn it around mm. and um, that's showing that this place the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium is becoming a bit of a fortress at the moment and to be only two points behind Arsenal and Man City who have been unbelievable at home this mm. season is unbelievable to be honest it really is so uh, big up to Ange for making this home place a bit of a fortress this now we need to make the you know, we need to up our performances and our result output on a consistent basis away from home. That's mm. that's where it's at at the moment. But at home, we are getting results time and time again and very consistent. So things you love to see. But let's move on to number five, and that is second half Spurs. Once again, how, how many times have we done this yeah. on the takeaways? Until we have not become a second half Spurs, <laughs> we're going to do it. Well, we haven't won a game uh, when leading at half time since the 31st of December, which was Bournemouth at home, which is incredible. We actually haven't led at half time since Everton away which was uh, back in February uh, it's the sixth time in our last 10 games that Spurs have won when not leading a half time so it's clearly a theme where we we struggle to kind of uh, um, f uh, kind of imp like control the game in the first half we have to figure teams out and then the second half uh, we usually dominate and we usually have do have control we usually take the game to the opposition and end up winning the game so look I don't know whether, again, we've said it before, I don't know whether it is a problem and things he has to figure out or whether he's happy that, you know, in the second half, we do seem to figure out how the opposition is playing, how they're approaching the game, and we seem to come out on top more often than not. And we do seem to have control in those second halves. That's really, really positive. But uh, we haven't won when leading at half time since September 31st. So that is uh, something that needs to change. Yeah, look, it does worry me in terms of maybe the immediate future. But I think in the long term, I do think Ange will sort this out. And I think once we get uh, maybe more players in the summer and sort the squad out a bit more and Ange has had maybe another pre-season behind them and ingrained his ideas a bit more into the squad, I do think this is going to be sorted out right now in, in the immediate future. It is a worry, but I don't think long term it should be a worry. Mm. Um, but that is your five takeaways from the 3-1 win over Nottingham Forest on the weekend. Let us know if you've got any more thoughts on the game in the comments section below. Let's move on and finish the stream on everyone's favorite segment and that is react
Xbox, where we go and look at the internet and see how it did react to the game yesterday. First up is SVR saying the whole stadium singing Mickey's song where Vicario and Timo were hyping him up. And this was such a nice moment yeah. because at the end of every game, it usually goes from um, Free From Desire all the way back into the Ange song, um, Angels by Robbie Williams. But they changed it up this time and they played uh, Mickey Van Der Ven's song, uh, Give It Up, uh, throughout the um, speakers in the stadium. And everyone went absolutely wild, didn't they? Yeah, it was brilliant. And he, he deserves his props. And I just love that moment. You see like Werner and Vicara pointing and jumping up and down and singing Van Der Ven's song as well. Lovely moment for him. And obviously, we know he gets a lot of credit and he was, they were singing his song very loudly yesterday. And after the game, he said in an interview, he really loves how much the fans uh, appreciate him and how much they support him. And I'm sure he's feeling that love as well. And that was a really lovely moment after the game. I was reading a report on Mickey van der Ven, uh, comments from his old coach at Volodam um, in Holland. And they said, apparently, uh, they said that they didn't think van der Ven was going to make it because he wasn't fast enough. I was like... <laughs> You should not be a coach <laughs> if you think that. Like this guy is literally one of the quickest guys in in European football <laughs> ever. Like it's nuts. I don't know how that could ever be the case where you think he's not quick enough. Like how slow? He, can't, he couldn't have been much slower before. I just can't believe it. Unreal. Um, next up is from Sonny Seven Y, um, and this is Pedro Porro just slapping Sonny on the arse uh, <laughs> after Porro scored that goal. And Sonny put him in a headlock. Absolutely love it. <laughs> He, any, the only player he allow him to put him in a headlock is Sonny. Maybe Romero as well. <laughs> Romero for sure. <laughs> uh, ben Haynes uh, tweeted out saying, immaculate full-time vibes featuring Mickey van der Ven. And this is just another angle of um, those scenes at halftime with Mickey. Yeah, he had a really nice moment. You can see on the, there was a, uh, on the big screen there, they had a, um, someone was holding a placard uh, of his song as well. Uh, such a lovely moment. And I'm um, so happy that uh, he got the goal that his play deserved because he's such an important player um, on him. And I think uh, there, has, there has to be maybe a conversation, are we too reliant on him? Maybe that'll be for a panel show. But I thought, yeah, so happy he got his props. I think we're most definitely too reliant on mm. him because you can see it um, in the clear with the wins and the losses with and without uh, Van der Ven. One loss this season in the Premier League when Van der Ven's played the whole game. Yes, you can put that Chelsea game in there, but he went mm. off early because of an injury. Um, Zara, this is what it means. And this is Sonny showing that oh. passion. I love Sonny's passion. It's just unbelievable. Never get bored of Sonny showing passion. He's got so much to give as well. Brilliant. I love the fans in the background. Look at that old guy that, who's got... Uh, you're just behind Sonny there. Oh, I love it. <laughs> love it. Brilliant stuff. Um, Ayudi saying, just a kiss, in my opinion. And this is Sonny and Van der Ven embracing each other after the game. Just kiss him. I, he wants him to kiss, I think. <laughs> <laughs> just kiss already, just come guys. Come on, all right. We Too see much how much sexual tension in the air. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Jay Andrew says, Spurs do often have the solution to win, game, uh, win a given game. Just sometimes... Um, game needs to play out to see what you need. I see the vision very clearly. We need some more tools to replace some of the tools we have. To be clear, certain players are reaching their ceilings in the team. Do you agree with that? Um, yeah, I think so. I, I think I agree with the, definitely the first part. Some I, I, A lot of the time at the moment... Um, teams are coming out with a way to stop us and then we kind of change up in the second half and all of a sudden they can't stop that so I think that is important to note as well just because you can't win it straight from the start doesn't mean when you're finding the solutions you shouldn't have credit for that uh, how we do in the second half and that should be credited um, but I, I think I, if you can't see the vision I mean I see it very clearly the way we're playing uh, when we're really on our football uh, it, we're really hard to stop and that's why we keep scoring in waves I think obviously the goal the next phase is do that consistently over 90 minutes obviously have control over 90 minutes all that kind of stuff and have complete control of the game but the most important thing is having those moments in the game where the team are really clicking and we're having those waves of attacks and, and we're very, very hard to stop. And then we've got that. And then the goal is, you know, you want to stretch that out over the whole game. That's why I, I don't like to compare us to them lot, but that's why I kind of look at it a bit similar to maybe their season when they finished fifth, because you saw kind of 
fits and spurts of a really good team coming to life and coming to fruition, but they just needed a few more pieces of that jigsaw to really say that uh, uh, to show that real consistency from a ninety minute from a ninety minute period from minute one till the ninetieth minute from the next season. You saw them going on a title charge. You saw them starting the season like one like prime Barcelona mm. that season, and then they fell off when they got those injuries again. But Spurs, you're seeing the nucleus. You're seeing like fits and spurts of a really good side, but we can't sustain it from a, for a full ninety minute period. I do think once we add a few more jigsaws um, pieces to the puzzle in the summer, you're going to see a team that can sustain things for more than just maybe like half an hour spurts. Yeah, I was having this debate uh, today on the WhatsApp group. I said the biggest difference between us and the top three is is time difference. I think. It's what do you mean by thing. that? In terms of how much time they've had together compared to us, I think that is the largest difference. Obviously, the, there is still a quality difference. We need to get a few more pieces in the puzzle. But I think the largest gap between us and the top three is just the time. And once we catch up on the time, I think we're going to be catching up with them. Yeah, I do think maybe we started the project a bit further further along than maybe Arsenal did because you look if you look at Ange Postecoglou's first eleven, you look at Arteta's first eleven. I do think they're miles apart in terms of quality. Um, but I do think you're right in terms of if given Ange more time, giving him time to get more of his players in, you're going to see a team absolutely firing on all cylinders. Yeah. Um, next up is from Ayudi saying, hmm. And this is the moment that we were talking about before in the player ratings with Hoybier and Hyungmin Son uh, and that infamous free kick now. <laughs> infamous. And I don't know yeah, you what you can see. Son yeah, look, Sonny wants it clearly, but Hoybier is like, no, I'm taking, I'm taking. Why? Sonny should be putting his foot down saying, look, I'm the captain. So I'm... Who is on free kicks? Is anyone like, do we have a, de he's surely our designated free kick taker. How many has he taken this season? Yeah, not many, I don't think. Like, I don't know. I think our free kick, is our free kick taker not Madison? Well, Madison's Oh, uh, you're right. Maybe it's Madison Son. or Porro even. Maybe Porro as yeah. well. Porro takes quite a few. But I think Sonny in this, on this occasion, he should be saying, look, Hoybier, this is, this is a situation I'm going to be taking the on free what, kick. On what grounds does Hoybier get to take a free kick? I don't yeah. understand. No, on I what don't grounds? Like, when have we ever seen Hoybier take a free kick? I don't ever. understand it. But you, uh, you can see, like, Sonny just a bit, a bit resigned to it, but I don't know why he is. He should be a bit more forceful, in my yeah, opinion, and just say, um, just take the ball off him. Sam Cornish up next saying, na, 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 Mickey van der Ven. And that's a, a lovely Look snapshot of the goal rippling into the, um, into the corner of the net. That's a stunning picture. I love that. It's Van der Ven wheeling away. Matt Sells just couldn't move as well. Then it was it was past him before he even knew it, wasn't it? What a rocket! Absolute <laughs> rocket! The Premier League tweeted out saying Spurs have now scored 11 goals through defenders this season, the joint most in the Premier League with Arsenal, um, and that was exactly what we highlighted in the five takeaways as well. Yeah, and it's very as we said, it's very important that defenders can chip in as well. And we look, I think, in terms of attacking quality, our defenders um, have really good ability in the final third, and they're starting to show. It, I think. Yeah, and for far too long as well, like we haven't had goal scoring um, back four, um, even right back, left back, centre backs. They have just haven't been chipping in it in enough or way enough. And probably since the um, the Vertonghen, Alderweireld, mm. Rose and Walker days. But even then, like Rose would get like what one or two goals a season. Maybe Walker wouldn't really get. Um, too many get goal a few contributions assists, but, yeah, yeah. Not goals. in terms of goals not really many and uh, Vertonghen came with this reputation of being a mad goal scoring centre back but even him I was quite disappointed with his output in terms of goals well it's a big uh, difference to last season isn't it last season we had Longley we had Dyer, we had Emerson playing a lot we had um, Regulon as well yeah. um, so uh, phew, it's a big difference yeah it was our left back Reg no, not Regulon sorry back? Perisic Perisic yeah per well, was Regulon there last year no, Reglon was out on loan, wasn't he not? That's right, he was in on, in Conte's first six months, he was mm -hmm. there, yeah, yeah. Uh, Spurs Express saying a uh, Vicario, and this is his comment in reply to Mickey van der Ven saying, come on you Spurs, Vicario commented saying, I wanted to hug you, but I was too far away. Oh, you're never too far away, Vicario. <laughs> we, we've seen you run the length of a pitch for a hug. Come on, man. Not a good excuse. Uh, Ridroll says uh, he always so proud when others do well. And this is Hyungmin Son. Um, just, this is when the Van der Ven song was on again, and he's just so happy. Look at that smile. Like a proud father. Yeah, exactly. Love it. Uh, Matthew Boredom says uh, a couple of goals created that are own goals that don't show the stats and that's obviously in reply to um, a tweet that we put out about um, Timo, Verna. Timo Werner's goal contributions this season yeah and that's absolutely right yeah 
Tottenham tweeted out a very sad news yesterday uh, that we are deeply saddened to hear the passing of former player Joe Kinnear. The thoughts of everyone at the club are with the family and friends at this inc incredibly sad time. And obviously a very successful player for Spurs uh, mm. was Joe Kinnear in the 60s. Yeah, he won. I think he won the FA Cup. I think he won the UEFA Cup as well. And there was nothing quite like a Joe Kinnear uh, of pro post-match interview, I think. He was yeah. one of the funniest guys in a post-match interview. You never know what he's going to say. Yeah, he never uh, managed Spurs, did he? No, unfortunately not. But he was a really good defender for us and yeah. uh, won a few trophies as well. Absolutely. Uh, Spurs Express tweeting out some quotes from Nuno yesterday on his return to Spurs for the first time since his sacking. And he says, it was just another game. It was a pleasure to work here at Spurs. It was an honour. Things didn't work out, didn't finish well. I keep on going. Spurs keep on going. It was special to come here. It was always special to come to a place where you've worked. But that doesn't take away from my focus on the team. And obviously, Sonny and Nuno had a nice embrace after mm. the game. Um, but yeah, it was just one of those things. I mean, Nuno, how long was he actually in the job for? What, three months? Uh, he got sacked in November time, early yeah. November. So yeah, he was there from like July to, to November time. Uh, I think it didn't work out is uh, an understatement. But um, look, is what it is with Nuno. Uh, he's hopefully he can keep North Forest up for them. But yeah, I, I, I can't say I, I miss him or anything because I don't <laughs> think that's true. <laughs> yeah, they didn't like give him a welcome back on the Tannoy or anything like they've done with like, I don't know if they did it for Pochettino either, but they do it for players, don't they? Mm. Um, I thought it would have been a nice touch from Spurs, even though it didn't work out, but yeah. it wasn't to be. I don't think he was getting a applause or an ovation when he came, came in. <laughs> we should have given him applause just because he's not at the club anymore. No. Um, but Sonny tweeted out saying, I got my cheek pinched by the director and this was Nuno and the Sonny and Brad that I just yeah, spoke yeah, about. Yeah. Not a little nice though, but to be fair, if it wasn't for Sonny, that they put uh, Nuno top of the league for a time because he scored the winner against City in the opening day, scored the winner against Watford. And so uh, Sonny was the only one really stepping up at that time, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, it's true. Um, THFC report saying Hyungman Son and Nuno, uh, another yeah. picture of their embrace yesterday. Spurs Express tweeted out saying player of the match, Mickey van der Ven with his man of the match award yesterday. Yeah, fully deserved it. Hotspur reports um, this was the challenge from Danilo on Giovanni Lo Celso compared yeah. to the challenge of Cuti Romero on, um, who is that? That's on uh, Enzo. Enzo. So, I mean, one was ascending off and one wasn't. You tell yeah. me why. And the Romero one was pulled, wasn't, was actually pulled back from VAR as well. So look how much higher the Danilo one is. And as well, it looks like it's, it was also quite forceful. He was coming with a lot of force into that. Um, it was a dangerous challenge. So I, I, I just don't, don't know why there's double standard. Why is VAR getting involved in the Romero one? and uh, not in the Danilo one. Is it a reputation thing, maybe? I, d I just don't know why they're getting involved in one and not the other. I think it's a double standard. Yeah, totally agree. Stat Muse FC saying Spurs lost Harry Kane last summer. They are now back in fourth. They have a better win percentage this season than any of their last four seasons with Kane. Wow. So we're, we're, we're a better team without Harry Kane. But what we're, where, everyone says, it, where would we be if Kane did stay this season? Who, who knows? It's who true. knows? It's a shame that he didn't end up staying, but... Yeah, I mean, there have been a couple of games like where you can see that we are missing a Harry Kane, like a proper kind of physical striker up top. Mm. Um, I think the West Ham game was a was a key factor in that. Maybe even a lot of first half games, Wolves games, probably. Wolves games. Yeah, so mm. like these kind of games we are missing him desperately. But um, I think from from an objective view, when you're looking at the whole team, we are performing a lot better without maybe heavily mm. relying on Harry Kane. Mm. Um, Lily White Rose saying uh, Tottenham have matched their points tally from the 22 23 season, 60 points with seven games left to play, albeit we do have very hard fixtures from now until the end of the season. The question is, how many do we end on? Yeah, I think um, you've got to expect six points from Burnley and, and Sheffield yeah, United. Yeah, so we'll put that 66. So then, uh, so then out of the next five, there's Chelsea, Newcastle, Liverpool away, and then City and Arsenal at home. Bloody hell. Yeah, and Newcastle. Did you mention Newcastle? Yeah, yeah. Newcastle. Chelsea, Newcastle, and Liverpool away. Yeah, I, I would like to say... Do we hit 70? Zero at Anfield. Yeah, that's guaranteed. Um, I just can't say a loss at Ars against Arsenal, so I'm going one or three points at Arsenal. Uh, let's go conservative and say one. Um, let's say Man City at home. Let's just say a loss. A loss. Uh, because it, we don't mind it this time round. Um, and Newcastle, I think we can go to Newcastle and win. 
And They're I think just so go, depleted. And I think we'd go to Chelsea and win as well. I would say, let's say four points out of those two. Yeah, okay. So Sammy that's five. Uh, so 11 more points. That's 71. I would take that. That should get us top four. Yeah, 71. I mean, uh, Villa get more than 71. They've had an unbelievable season. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, Villa got to go to Arsenal next week without Douglas Luiz. And they've still got Liverpool as well to play. So mm. they've also got some tough games. That, that Villa Arsenal game is kind of like a win win for us, isn't it? Because mm. if, if Villa win, then you're like, all right, cool, Arsenal aren't winning the league. And if Arsenal win, you're like, all right, cool, we're getting top four. Part of me, yeah, wants Villa <laughs> to win, just uh, even if it's bad for us. Part of <laughs> you. My whole being wants Villa to win. <laughs> Fair um, enough. Jake Yedlin says, uh, Werner's relative success, despite his limitation, just so how much better we could be uh, with a top leveling winner out there for 50 million he's no brainer as depth but we should be still looking to invest in a better starter and mm. um, I couldn't put it better myself because as much as I, I'm happy to keep Werner here next season we still need someone better to rival him yeah imagine we had a winger who just go two ways and just a bit more quality just, or, uh, like a lot more quality than what Timo does as I said like Timo's doing like the really simple things like really effectively but imagine we had a winger who could do the not so simple things effectively as well yeah. then it could take us up a notch yeah uh, Tottenham tweeted out the uh, iconic walks into the uh, the dressing room after the game Porro obviously uh, that, well I don't know that's just vanished Still where'd here? that go? well which one? no uh, on screen uh, but anyway on the same one on the same oh one. is it the same yeah, thing? yeah Anyway, just the delighted Spurs fans after uh, Spurs players after the game. I, yeah, that was a moment. Yeah, look, Van de Ven and Vicario dancing to uh, <laughs> the Van de Ven. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. What a, what a moment! Uh, Spurs Express tweeted out uh, Vicario on Instagram saying, "Oh, when the Spurs go march again, great atmosphere and three more points, buzzing." Uh, Vic- you, yeah. I just can't get enough of Vicario. Seriously, he's embracing the, the Tottenham so much. Absolutely love it. He loves the clearly he loves the chance as well. Big up. Alfie tweeting out uh, Porro scoring after 127 premier shots without a goal. <laughs> it deserves a standing ovation, I think. Yeah, it definitely deserves a standing ovation. Uh, and there you have it there, the standing <laughs> ovation. Obviously, the watch along from AFTV. Um, the next one is from Sonny again saying, Mickey and Son Hyung Min, what is that makes Son Hyung Min give you a hug to? <laughs> of course, yeah. Everyone, look, everyone's giving him a hug. He's like, wait, I need my hug. Love that. Don't go anywhere without giving me a hug. Exactly. <laughs> Big up, son. Uh, Simon Yemeni saying, heroes at the back, killers up front. Uh, um, deleted deleted tweet. Spurs Express with Kuti Romero on Instagram saying, great game, great second half. Surely these are things to improve, but this is the way all together until the end. And this is what Romero says this after every single <laughs> game. So this is the way. I'm sure there's, everyone's full of belief. Love it. Spurs watched. Uh, this is P- Pedro Porro's celebration after the, his goal, and he's always uh, yeah. showing that badge as well. He's got some passion for Spurs, Pedro Porro. He loves Spurs. Absolutely love it. Because there's always these rumours about, oh, will he leave Spurs? But he does seem to absolutely love Spurs, doesn't yeah, he? He? Does. he always points to the badge whenever he does something. Spurs official tweeting out sensational. This is Van der Ven's celebration. He's got his own little celebration as well, cupping the ear and, and pointing. <laughs> exactly. He wants to hear the Spurs fans shout louder. Come on. Uh, this is another one from Sonny, a nice embrace again from Mickey van der Ven and Son Hyung Min yesterday. Yeah, come on. Um, and I think, is that it? No, there's more. Uh, Spurs Express saying, help uh, turn the tide of the game back in Tottenham's favour after coming on at half time. This is Rodrigo Bentancourt and Pierre Amorhoibier appreciation post. And I thought both of them were brilliant yesterday. I saw some, uh, some uh, posts actually yesterday saying, are we back? And it was just clips of Hoybier and Bentancourt from last season. <laughs> double pivot. Oh, we're back. We're back at the double pivot. Come on, boys. Uh, talking THFC saying he finally did it he made us proud so proud <laughs> so proud you know thank you so much for the three points uh, Tottenham Tears saying Mickey van der Ven versus Forrest in numbers 100% tackles 5 out of 5 100% ground jewels 3 out of 3 94% park- passing accuracy 84 touches 6 po- times possession 1 3 out of 5 aerial jewels 0 times dribble pass 0 fouls 43 million worth every penny yeah what a performance what a signing can't believe how good he's turned out to be. I just couldn't be happier with him. 
tweets from, um, well, comments from Timo Werner after the game saying, I do the best I can to assist and help the team, which uh, with my runs and putting balls into the box, I'm very happy that Mickey van de Ven scored today. I'm enjoying my time here a lot. I have to smile a lot next to Mickey because I'm spending a lot of time with him. I joked yesterday that he would score. I am loving it here. And he's a, clearly a man that wants to stay at this football club. Yeah, definitely. And he seems like a man just completely um, switched in his confidence from a few months ago when he was a Leipzig, not playing. And uh, I wonder, do you reckon has he played well enough to get into that Germany squad yet or...? Still Who do they the have air. out on their left? They've got like Sane, Nabri on the left. I'm trying to think. Um, can't can't think of who's on who's on the left wing for Germany right now. I think he, he can make a late run for a squad option, but not mm. starting. Maybe he needs a few more goals. Yeah, I would think so. It's Walker with some tweet with some stats for us uh, against Nottingham Forest. Kuti Romero won the most aerial duels and did not lose a single one. Five out of five. And Mickey van der Ven made the most successful tackles five and was not dribbled past once. And he did not lose a single ground duel as well. Five out of five. Mm. And like we keep saying, the yin to each other's yang. Exactly, and they're, they're, they've turned turned out to be a really great, effective partnership, and they really do well uh, together. It's really, really great stuff, and I think we've. We've, in terms of profiles, we've done a really good job pairing those two together. Oh, and and some. And yeah. uh, look, we were going for Taps Over in the summer, and who's to say Taps Over wouldn't uh, wouldn't have provided the same impact as Mickey Van der Ven? But I couldn't be happier uh, with Mickey and Cootie in the mm. back four t- in the back two together. Um, That's it, I think. Is that it? Yeah. All right, that is it. That is all we have for Reacts. I want to thank you all uh, for joining us in the stream today. A nice long one for you guys to get your teeth bitten into. A great win at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Spurs into the top four. And and we've also got the same tally as we ended on last season. So things are all going in the right direction for Tottenham Hotspur. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Like, subscribe and comment. And as always, come, come on, on you Spurs. Spurs.